how you got involved with documenting, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, well, Mike, I, I went to theater school, you know, and we would stage plays, uh, like some original plays, some things that I wrote, and we would work, you know, two months, maybe three months, and just put all the effort into it we could possibly put in to get the great show that we really wanted. And sometimes we'd really achieve that and we'd have a wonderful show. And then we'd put it on and it would run for like one night, two nights. And then the thing closes and you're thinking, why did I put all that work into that? Like, well, how is that over so quickly? And it's just gone. There's no evidence of it. It's just gone. So I saw the need to, you know, try to like record it somehow. So I, you know, got a fairly cheap video camera and like put it at the, at the back of the theater where the play was going on and I realized right away, you can't get anything this way. You're going to have to bring the camera up and see the close up. When the, the climax of the scene happens, I need to see that guy's eyes. So, you know, I put the camera where I needed to put it and like repeated the action and staged it. And before you knew it, I was making features really. And it just kind of naturally led to being interested in camera angles and lenses. And, you know, I never, I mean, I probably would have gone to film school if I could have afforded it, or there was a film school somewhere in West Virginia, but there wasn't any film school in West Virginia. So I just did the best I could to teach myself how to shoot. And then, you know, later on, I got a job at public television and there wasn't really anybody there that was much better at it than I was because I had already understood like how lenses work and you know how uh, to stage something and how you need to get coverage and you know take some cutaways and so I was already two steps ahead of most of the people working there so I got the chance to like make a couple documentaries and Lo and behold, they were successful, amazing. <laughs> and, you know, I got a couple trips to Europe out of it, started building a reputation, and so that's kind of how I became a documentary filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So, had you done um, any documentaries prior to, like your biggest one, would you say, is The Dancing Outlaw? Yes. Um, that Tell is... me a little bit about that real quick, because that's probably going to be uh, something that people in this area can relate to. Sure. Uh -huh. Well, you know, I've made a lot of documentaries, but no matter what I ever do, I always get introduced as the guy who made The Dancing Outlaw. And that's because um, I, I don't even think it's my best documentary, to tell you the truth. But it seemed to push all the right buttons for West Virginia. You know, it was about the sort of ne'er-do-well dancer and, and people were like, thought that I maybe made this film to represent like the state of West Virginia. Nothing could be farther from the truth, really. You know, I thought this Jesco White was a really unique individual and I'd never met anybody like him. He was definitely dangerous. Um, you know, I was run off uh, his place at gunpoint like three or four times in the process of trying to make that film. So the film does have a sort of a I don't know, a feeling of, that it's on the edge a little bit or that things could go seriously wrong here at any time. And that's how it was when we were making it. You know, I went through about four sound men, like working on Just Go White. Like, I would, the, I would be like driving out of the place and the sound man would look over and say, well, you know, that was interesting, but I am never going back into that place. And uh, so, uh, you know, it was a little shaky. Um, but, you know, if you put yourself in a situation like that, it always ends up like showing in the film. You take a risk, you know, that, that feeling gets into the film somehow. And so then I sort of like got hooked on that. You know, I'd look for situations that had some kind of edge or some kind of danger, you know, someplace with something, there might be a little gunplay here. I'm going to be more interested in that situation. And, you know, I got involved in like several other documentaries, which were, way more dangerous. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever seen, I made a documentary called Holy Cow Swami about the Swami Bhaktipod. And he was a Hare Krishna leader who was convicted of contract murder, uh, the sexual abuse of children, uh, insurance fraud, um, copyright violations. I mean, you pretty much named the crime like Swami Bhaktipod was accused of it at one point or other. And uh, when I first got involved in working with him, 
I was interested in trying to exonerate him because I really didn't think he was guilty of all these things that he was accused of. And the more and the more, the more and more I worked on the film, just the uglier and the uglier it got. Until in the end of it, the feds like used some of my material to prosecute him. And he ended up going to prison for like five years for one of the contract murders that he perpetuated. But, um, you know, at, at the height of that film, they were threatening my life like every day or two. I would get these phone calls from the, the guy up at the compound there that was their enforcer. And, you know, midnight my phone would ring and he would say, the Swami thinks you need a new body. <laughs> and, you know, of course what that means, it's time for your reincarnation which means they might be coming to get you like any time now. So, you know, I actually went up there at one point and went to see the Swami and said, you know, Swami, I really don't want any of your people around my house. If you ever want to off me, you just call me and I'll come right up. But please don't, you know, my children and my wife are not guilty of anything. If I offended you somehow, take it out on me, you know. And so, you know, I have been in a few situations where I really didn't know how it was going to go. And when, when was that, that you did that uh, um, documentary? That was finished in... What was that, that was pre or post the, um, the Dancing Outlaw? That was after the Dancing Outlaw. Okay. Movie. Yeah. Uh, and now, uh, see, you did the Dancing Outlaw, and then did you not do a sequel to that as well? Yes, yes. Well, what happened with that is the Dancing Outlaw just went everywhere. Like, it was all over Europe. It aired on the BBC and lots of European stations. And and one another place the Dancing Outlaw showed up a lot was, like, on in Hollywood parties and on tour buses, especially, like, rock and roll bands would have it on their tour bus and play it. And so sometimes I would get invited on the tour bus sometimes to see what was, you know, what, see that they were watching my movie. So it was one of these Hollywood parties, Roseanne Arnold and Tom Arnold like saw The Dancing Outlaw and they wrote him into one of the episodes of their show. And they called me, you know, and said, Jacob, you know, would you bring Jessica White to Hollywood? And I said, no way, you know, like, I don't want to be responsible for him. You know, what, what kind of damage he might do, you know? And they said, well, what would your, you know, can we convince you somehow? And I said, well, maybe if you would let me shoot. And then they had to think about that because, you know, the Roseanne set was like Fort Knox as far as any like, you know, outside like shooting or photography. And so they came back finally and said, well, yeah, we'll give you like carte blanche. You can have free run of our set if you'll just bring him out here and like watch him, you know, take care of him. So we talked to public TV and uh, got a little funding and then Tom Arnold threw in like quite a bit of money for the project. And so that's how the sequel, um, Dancing Out Lot 2, Jesco Goes to Hollywood, that's how that came about. Um, it's an interesting movie because uh, when we got to uh, Hollywood uh, with Jesco, uh, it was just at the day that uh, Roseanne Arnold found out that Tom Arnold was having an affair with like one of the people that worked on the show and they were having this incredible blowout fight and just as a coincidence so were Jesco and Norma Jean at the time and like they it was this kind of funny lesson I mean if there's a lesson of Dancing Outlaw 2 it's that you know white trash will be white trash it doesn't really matter if you have 20 billion dollars you know or how much how poor or how rich here are these two couples on the absolute opposite spectrum of like the economic ladder and they were behaving in exactly the same way you know